Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to study your word together. I ask that you filter out all of that which is foolish and ignorant, but just seal to our hearts the truth that you would have us know that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. In our Sunday studies, we are going through 2 Corinthians verse by verse, and in our last study together, we were at the 7th verse of the 4th chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. Moses had an experience uh, which had never happened before. God had taken him up uh, Mount Sinai and spoke to him face to face. He spoke directly with God and that had never happened before. Moses uh, must have come down from the mount with great anticipation. Uh, he held in his hands two copies of a contract uh, between God and his people. He had already been uh, told that the copies of this contract were to be housed in an ark that was made of wood, speaking of the humanity of Christ, yet overlaid with gold, speaking of his deity. It must have been an incredible experience. He had seen the finger of God engrave uh, the law in, in tables of stone, uh, a covenant. Uh, and that covenant was to be housed in an ark which pictured our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It seems that Moses, you know, must have been saying, I can't wait to get down there. You know, God had the children of Israel prepare themselves for this experience that already indicated to Moses that he took uh, too much upon himself as the leader of the people, uh, that they also would like to communicate with God. And God said, you know, basically said, all right, you have the people prepare themselves and uh, take three days, then I want them to come to the mount. I'll descend uh, upon the mount, they'll see the presence of Jehovah, and I'll speak to them, and God came down after three days. So there were the people all gathered around Mount Sinai, and at the base of the mount, and God said, basically said, hello. Uh, I know I'm kind of reading the white spaces there, and, and they all fell back. They all trembled in fear, and they said, Moses, we, we thought this over. You know, you talk with God, uh, we'll go back here and wait, and you let us know what he said. And the first thing I want you to see in the picture here is that Moses, in, in speaking directly with God, he must have been horribly excited uh, about conveying that message to God's people. The second thing I want you to see is that the majority of God's people weren't really all that interested in speaking face to face with God. You know, they preferred Moses did it, and then and then convey the message to them. However, that must have been an awesome experience to gather before the foot of that mountain to see the cloud of the glory of Jehovah descend upon it and hear the thunder of his voice. You know, it's not something that someone would easily forget. Uh, Moses has been gone 40 days uh, and now with trembling excitement, he comes back to tell the people what he's heard and seen and what he carries with him. And, and there they are, worshiping a golden calf. And then we got the life of Paul, the Paul the apostle, the author, the human author of this epistle. Pharisee of Pharisees, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a highly educated man, extremely wealthy man, a married man with a family, and God strikes him down on the road to Damascus. You know, I'm afraid that many Christians, far too many Christians, look at Paul as, as a, he was a pagan who was converted on the road to Damascus. He was not. Uh, Paul was a skilled expert in the, the Word of Jehovah. He had dedicated his life to the study of the Old Testament Scriptures. And all of a sudden, light dawns. Uh, you know, what a marvelous message. And, and all of a sudden, God commands light to shine in Paul's heart. 
And now all of those scriptures that he knew so well suddenly made sense. You know, he must have been excited to go and tell other people. And now it all fits together. He, he sees in the ark the Lord Jesus Christ. He sees in the, in the God whose voice sounded like thunder the God of redemption and the Lord Jesus Christ. It all fits together. It's crystal clear. And with great excitement, he, he must have wanted to convey that message, and yet we find him deserted in prison. When he made his first defense in Rome, not one single man stood with him, and so he was arrested. Where were all these believers at then? You know, am I to conclude from the Scriptures that they didn't exist? I believe that they were there. You know, that they're going to spend eternity in heaven with Paul and they were silent when he was arrested and taken to Rome. So we find him in prison, deserted, not one man standing with him. Uh, Damas uh, had forsaken him. But he's not cast down. I'm told that in, I'm told by the Holy Spirit in Amos that in the last days God's gonna send a famine in the land, a land not a, a a famine for for pizza and and Mexican food or Chinese food or whatever, but but for uh, of hearing God's word. I believe that we are basically in the foothills of of that prophecy today, if not on our way up. Uh, I find it virtually impossible to turn on the radio and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, maybe you do. Uh, if you do, I wish you'd give me the list of the stations so that I could also be fed. What I find is a tremendous amount of adulteration. I find a tremendous number of people professing to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, but what they're preaching is not what I read. Now, somebody's got to be wrong. In the book of Timothy, we, we read that in the last days, perilous times will come, and today we, we see crime and corruption everywhere we look. If you've watched the news lately at all, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, these are indeed perilous times, but Paul doesn't mention any of that. Apparently, God doesn't consider that very perilous. He considers perilous wanting your own way. He considers perilous handling the Word of God deceitfully. Paul declares that he's been faithful in the proclamation of the Word of God, and that has not made him very popular. He's a deserted and forsaken man in prison. Yet apparently today, the proclamation of the Word of God gathers together vast majorities of people so that we can get our shoulder behind the wheel and we can get things accomplished for Christ. I don't see that description. And now I see in verse 7, uh, remember the chapter began, therefore seeing we have this ministry, that's, that's Moses' excitement in the mount. That's, that's Paul's excitement after he was converted on the road to Damascus. It all, that's Paul's tremendous excitement when it all fits together. Now I have the light. I understand the Scriptures. You know, we have this uh, tremendous ministry. We don't get discouraged. and you got to be kidding me. Well, how could Moses or Paul or you and I how could we get discouraged? Man, it all fits together. I mean, how can you get discouraged with the truth? Moses had the covenant. He had the covenant, the Word of God, in his hands. Now he's going to go down and he's going to tell it to the people. You know, no reason to get discouraged. But when he went down, they were worshiping the golden calf. Now I begin to read that we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be not from us. My Greek says that it may be out of God and not from us, that God is the source. We are not the source. 
The Lord Jesus Christ says, I send you forth as sheep among wolves. What shepherd does that? I mean, you don't send sheep out among wolves. Sheep, sheep don't stand a chance against wolves. Now, we're all sheep, and Christ says, I send you out as sheep among, you, among wolves. What do you think we ought to do? You know, get together and say, well, how do we get these wolves to become sheep? You don't really think that that's what we do, do you? What I hear on radio and TV, what I see on YouTube, what I read in books, what I hear promoted in churches today on every corner from coast to coast here in America is how Christians ought to try to get wolves to become sheep. I don't think that's what sheep would do. And if they did, they'd get eaten up I mean, why does the Lord send us out as sheep among wolves? That the excellency of the power may be of God and not ourselves. You know, if he, if he just sent us all out as, as star quarterbacks, I mean, you know, you know, we wouldn't need Christ. There wouldn't be any need for the excellency of the power to be of God and, and not of ourselves. But he, he didn't send us out as... as as superheroes, okay? He sent us out in burnt and broken clay pots, which is what my Greek reads, by the way. And now I begin verse 8. We are troubled on every side and so forth. These are the verses that we're now looking at. And almost every Christian I talk to thinks that's the ungodly world that does this. The you know, those who hate Christ, they do this and they, and they persecute the church. And folks, there may be some element of truth in that, but Paul was not greatly concerned about the pressures of the Roman government, but the apathy of God's people. Fast forward to today, 2023 AD, and, and here we are. Oh, man, what a message we have. A message of grace and liberty in Christ Jesus. So, so excited, you know, to just like maybe Moses would have been, Paul would have been. And I look around and what do I see? God's people caring so little about God's Word that they resemble the same picture we see in the lives of both Moses and Paul. You know, the worship of idols standing not with, but against the true messenger of the Word of God. God declares in straightforward language, He, he doesn't pull any punches, that He redeemed the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. I, I don't know what redemption means to you, but, but I know what redemption means to me. They were redeemed out of the land of Egypt. That is a finished transaction. They're redeemed, but they perished in the wilderness. They perished in the wilderness. And most of my Christian friends think that, think that they were redeemed in Egypt and they went to hell because they died in the wilderness. And that leaves me with the inescapable conclusion that only Caleb and Joshua got to heaven. You know, Moses didn't make it. Uh, Numbers 20, verse 12 and the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I've given them. Moses didn't go into the promised land because he didn't believe God. Moses did not go to hell. But I, I, I don't think he entered into rest, and I don't think Aaron entered into rest I don't think anybody entered into, into rest of that first generation that were redeemed except Caleb and Joshua, but I think they all went to heaven. Here we got Moses. He, he comes down from the mount. He's the leader of God's people. They're redeemed. You know, that means that they have eternal life. And people think uh, his great problems are now with the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Moabites, the Hittites, you know, whateverites and you know, that's not true. The great problems were, were with these redeemed people. He was troubled on every side. 
Moses' great persecution was, was from God's people. What did redeemed people say uh, that were headed for heaven? We despise this light bread. They were speaking of the Word of God. And, you know, and you say, well, that's horrible. You know? it, it seems to me, I can, I can almost count on two hands the Christians I meet who really love the Word of God. I never meet a Christian who doesn't say he loves it, okay? All of them love it. But the truth is, the Christian community today is, is just like Israel. You know, they despise this light bread. We, and we got to add to it or take away from it. You know, we've been warned about that, folks, in this epistle. Most Christians, most, the majority, it says, adulterate the Word of God. I didn't say that. God did. God said that. We are not, as says Paul, we are not as most of the believers, the majority who corrupt the Word of God. The Word is adulterated. Uh, they pour water in the wine. There isn't anything wrong with water except you're deceiving the individual. You're telling, you're telling that person it's wine when it's really water, and that's deceitful. When we studied through Colossians, and many of you may remember, you know, we, we saw in chapter 2 that we're complete in Christ. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means, well, you could be, you could be uh, complete in Christ if you wanted to be. You know? Well, you're, you're pouring water in it. Because it doesn't say that. It says you are complete in Christ. And since we despise the, the Word of God, we despise the manna, the light bread, we, you know, we make up our own salvation, you know. Salvation means redemption. But I don't think it ever does in the Bible, but it surely does in common Christian circles today. Are you saved, brother? You know, are you saved, sister? You know, uh, by that we mean, are you going to heaven? And, and folks, you can't find that in the Scriptures. O Timothy, take heed unto, unto the doctrine, for in doing so thou shalt save, that is, deliver, thyself and them that hear thee. Well, there's Timothy preaching. He's not saved yet. I mean, I, folks, now if salvation means eternal life, that passage doesn't make any sense. Are, are you telling me that a person gets eternal life by taking heed unto doctrine? Uh, or he gets eternal life because Jesus Christ died in his place? I've got great news for you folks. All right, the gospel says that, you know, you could go to heaven if you want to. Well, that's pagan. That isn't Christian, folks. That is pagan. And you don't have a single verse that, to, that supports that. I've got really good news for you. Jesus Christ died in your place. You're not going to die. And, oh, but Steve, if you preach that, that, that may not be true of everyone. You know, and, and it, well, it's true of everyone that hears it. Because our gospel, it says, is hid to them that are perishing or being ruined. Verse 3. I don't worry about those. My purpose in life is not to convert wolves because you can't convert a wolf. He's a wolf. I mean, I mean can the leopard change its spots? Do we have any exhortation in the Bible that, that tear should become wheat or that wheat can ever become tear? Do we have any indication in Scripture at all that the seed of the woman could become the seed of the serpent? Ah, but we want to pour into that Word of God something that tickles the ear. It's exactly what we read in Timothy. You know, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having each, uh, itching ears. We heap to ourselves people who have itching ears and we preach the things that we think people want to hear. Because people do not want to hear the truth of this book. There's no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. I think that is great news. Don't you put any strings on it. 
you are complete in Christ. And I think that's grand news. Don't put any strings on it. God didn't. Folks, when you begin to pour in the water, pour water into the wine, you, you're diluting, you're adulterating, corrupting the Word of God. Our passage says that we are pressured on every side, yet we are not confined. Was Moses' great pressure from the, the, the non-elect? No, not, not primarily. He had some, but his primary pressure was from God's people, the elect. And that, and that seems to be the, the thing that people don't want to understand. That redeemed people headed for heaven despised the Word of God. That redeemed people headed for heaven despised the leadership of Moses, despised the witness of Paul. Think that you're nuts. You know, you're basically, you've gone Looney Tunes. You and I. The leadership of God vested in His Word through Moses and Paul and you and I. But the truth of the matter is that they did and they do. And we are living in the beginnings of that period of time when more and more of what is taught is not truth. It's adulterated truth. I'm not suggesting to you that there's no truth in it. There is. But in, in 1 Corinthians, we were told that the messengers of the devil are arrayed as messengers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, folks, they can't work that way if they don't have some wine. And, and, and you know, and once it gets to 100%, the, you know, you know they, they, they're, they gotta, they're gonna stop buying it. So there's, there's some truth someplace in, in any preaching, I, pretty much. I mean, as far as you look, when you look at a Christian context here of, of it. My passage tells me in 2 Corinthians 2 that the great dilution that concerns the Holy Spirit is the dilution made by Christians. It happens on every hand. I, I don't think this book is popular. I think the modern message of evangelism is popular. My Bible, however, expressly states that it will not be popular. It was true of God's people when He redeemed them out of the land of Egypt who, who perished in the wilderness because they didn't believe. And somehow or other, we, we've, we've taken a, a pagan philosophy and we've reversed it and we've said, you know, you, you all could get to heaven if you believe. You don't believe, you're not going to get to heaven. You're going to be like the children of Israel who perished in the wilderness and went to hell. How, how could any serious Christian believe that? Now, brethren, I wouldn't have you ignorant that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and they all ate the same spiritual food and they all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now, you don't think that the Canaanites drank of that rock, do you? Or the Babylonians, or, or the Egyptians, or, or the Ethiopians. But, but God's people drank of that rock. However, with most of them, with the majority of them, God was not well pleased. We are not like the many, says Paul, the majority who corrupt the Word of God. So, with many of them, God was not well pleased. They perished in the wilderness. That's our, that's our word perish in our present study. You can, you can say they all went to hell, but you're going to absolutely do violence to many passages of Scripture. I give unto my sheep eternal life. To whom did He give eternal life? To his sheep, they shall never perish. That's great news. That's grand news. It's not good news if you say to me that he did that potentially. You know, but you may or may not have that truth because you haven't accepted it. You know, ever since I was a kid, I, I used to, you know, I, I can remember being in vacation Bible school when I was like five, but I, I can remember growing up in the First Baptist Church when I was a small child and 
and uh, I've heard I've heard these super illustrations. You know, here you are. You know, I, you're in jail. I'm in jail. I've committed some crime for which I can't pay the penalty, and somebody comes along and pays my fine. You probably have heard the story before. The the jailer he unlocks the cell door. He says you're free, and I say why? Well, so so and so paid the fine. And, and, uh, but I don't like so-and-so, so, you know, I, I won't accept, you know, him. I, I don't like him, so I won't accept him. I, I was basically taught as a child I'm not free until I, by faith, walk out of that cell. Of course, that doesn't have any biblical support at all whatsoever, but uh, you got to be out of your mind. I, I can sit in that cell, folks, till I die, but I'm a free man. You can't change truth. The fine's been paid. I'm free. The truth is, I'm free. And you say, well, I don't believe it. Doesn't make any difference. Doesn't make any difference. Steve, well, Steve, are you saying that every man's redeemed? No, I'm saying the sheep of God are redeemed. They have eternal life. The others won't hear. The rest won't hear. Our gospel is hidden to them that are perishing. God commanded the light to shine in our hearts. You didn't make it shine. God commanded it to shine. And people don't like that. They don't like that. And that's why you get tossed out on your ear. That's why you're hated. How am I born into the family of God? Well, that is a decision that God made. You know, I was, I was preaching in Albuquerque, New Mexico once. It's been many, many years ago. And, and, and the pastor said, oh, if we could just get old so-and-so saved, you know, if you could just somehow address your message to old so-and-so. Now, I'd ne I would never do that. And, and I'd never give an invitation because I don't believe there's one in the Word of God. But this pastor did, and an old, uh, old guy comes up, and, and the pastor said, you know, to me, he said, would you talk to him? And I said, yeah, I'd be happy to talk to him. So I went down and, and I said the things that I think any, any personal worker ought to say. You know, hey, what's your name? You know, he told me. And, and I said, what do you think of the weather? And, and uh, he told me what he thought of the weather. And I said, well, do you know Jesus Christ is your own personal Savior? He said, no. I said, well, what do you think of the Bible? Oh, he said, I think that's God's Word. I said, you know, you think Christ is God? Yeah, he said. You think He died for your sins? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I think He did that. Do you believe that you're going to heaven? No. No. Well, I said, you're sure going to wake up surprised because you're going to be in heaven. The minister, he didn't, pastor of the church didn't like that at all. No, I don't believe an altar call is biblical. I think it was invented by Charles Finney in the 1800s, but that's, that's just me. You'd have to do your own research on that. We've, we've talked a lot about the, the difference between uh, Arminianism and, and the Gospel. I read Hebrews 10.7, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do Thy will, O God. Well, what is God's will? It's the will of the Father that none sh of His should perish, that He should give unto them eternal life. If Christ came to do that, He must have done it. And it looks to me like we as sheep ought to be greatly concerned about the integrity of the, sh of the sheep. The trouble is the sheep despise the light bread and therefore you know, we come with a fabulous message. That message is you're redeemed. The price is paid. You'll never perish. God won't leave you. He won't forsake you. He lights your candle. He bottles your tears. He's branded your name on the palm of His hand. He knows the way you take. And when He's tried you, you will, you shall come forth as gold. And so we're now going to make a mess of all that and say, well, now all of that would be true if you do something, if you'd believe. Good gravy, folks. Where, did, where do you get that? You didn't get it out of this book. But that's what I hear every day. 
But if I preach the word of truth, I'm not popular. Marvel not that the ecclesiastical or, or the religious system hates you. It, it hates you because it hated me first. It hates you because I elected you. I chose you. That's why it hates John chapter 6. In fact, read John 6, 66. 666. Read the, read the verse. All you have to do is, is proclaim that and you'll find out what hate really is. It doesn't come from people sitting on a bar stool or some liberal college campus. It comes from what people call evangelical, conservative, Bible-believing Christians who, who scream out that Jesus didn't choose anybody. You know, that we've got to choose Him. Or something like that. You know, I wish they'd leave my Savior's name out of it. The Lord Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's His people. Do you think He did that? He said it's finished. He must have done that. The Lord came to deliver His people from their sins. Deliver, not redeem. He, they're redeemed. He came to deliver them from their sins. He declared it as, as, uh, as finished. Now with such super great news as that, why am I pressured on every side? By who? Who am I pressured? Primarily, God's people. Well, I don't fall into the trap that so many have to, to make this, this passage roam and the and the unbelieving element who puts you to death thinking they're doing God's service or something like that. It's the believing element that does that. John was shown a vast multitude of martyrs whose blood was shed for the testimony of Jesus in the book of Revelation, and it says that he marveled with exceeding wonder. Why? Because they were put to death by the church. John wouldn't have marveled if they'd been put to death by a satanic element. They're put to death by religious fanatics. Okay. Who persecuted Moses? God's people. Until Moses declared that this is too much of a burden for me to bear. That's what Moses said. God very gently told him, and rather bluntly, in fact, that Moses wasn't doing the bearing. Anyway, we're pressured on every side, yet we're never confined. We're per perplexed, but not in despair. Why don't people want to, want to hear the good news? Because they want to have a part in it. If it's, if it's worth having, it's worth working for. You know, you know the old saying, right? You can't get to heaven without believing, somebody says. They don't have any scripture for that, but they say it. People like that. And now, now I've got something to do with going to heaven. I, I can sit there for the endless ages throughout all of eternity and I can say, boy, am I glad I believed. What if I hadn't? And that gives me just a tiny bit of the glory. Not much, but it gives me a little. I don't need much. I just need a little bit. Except my Bible tells me that God is extremely jealous and He won't share His glory with anybody. But I'd like a little bit. I admit that salvation is of the Lord. I admit I wouldn't be there if Jesus Christ hadn't died in my place. But boy, I'm sure glad I believed because if I had not gone to hell. Christ came to redeem His people and to raise up a horn of salvation for them is what this book says. Now, when you have a verse like that staring you directly in the face, what right do you have to say that salvation and redemption are synonyms? They're not. If He redeemed His people and raised up a horn of deliverance for them, salvation must mean something different. And it does. It means deliverance. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you know, Everyone's familiar, you know, verses 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also 
ye are saved, delivered, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. That seems to say that salvation is something different than standing in the truth. And of course it is. Moses was redeemed, folks. He wasn't saved. Okay? Caleb was redeemed and saved. We have no indication any place that Caleb ever did anything but trust God and he wound up in rest and peace and joy. Where are you if you don't trust God? You're, you're very distraught, but you're redeemed. God says to you, I place blood on the doorpost and you say, I, I, don't, I don't believe that. Well, you won't sleep very well, but you'll wake up alive because your father did in fact put blood on the doorpost. Or you might say, I believe my father put blood on the doorpost. And, and if he didn't, you're going to wake up dead because it doesn't matter whether you believe he put blood on the doorpost or not. What matters is, did he do it? Did he put blood on the doorpost? That's what matters. Helps to believe... doesn't matter whether you believe that Jesus Christ died in your place. That's not really what's important, folks. What's important is, did He die in your place? It'd be nice if you believed that, but, you know, many, I think many, many a Christian doesn't. They're redeemed, but they don't. They don't believe that. You know, if you don't believe that, you won't be delivered. But either way, you'll live. I, I think that's fantastic news. I just think that that's awesome news. In 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, I'm told that Jesus Christ died for us, that, 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 we, that we live together with Him, whether we're faithful or unfaithful, and I think that's fantastic news. Yet I rarely, if ever, hear that preached. My Heavenly Father says it doesn't depend on my faithfulness. It depends on Christ. That's why I live together with Him. Christ did not say, I, I give unto my sheep salvation. He said, I give unto them eternal life. There's not one place in the Word of God where one who is not redeemed is ever asked to believe. The children of Israel were not asked to believe uh, in, while they were in the land of Egypt. God redeemed them, and now, out in the wilderness, they were asked to believe. Most of them didn't. So they perished. They, they, they perished, and they went to heaven. It's a shame that many of us might be roaming around in the wilderness in unbelief. Now, I'm talking about redeemed people. What we are looking at, folks, in this chapter is the difficulty that that one experiences in the proclamation of truth. And what I'm anxious for you folks to see, and I've only given you several illustrations from the Scriptures, there, there's many. What I'm anxious for you to see is that your problems in the proclamation of the Gospel of Jesus Christ comes from Christians. We are pressured on every side, yet never confined. We are perplexed. You know, it's unbelievable that such a great message is of grand news where Jesus paid it all, He did it all, you don't have to do anything, you know, would be looked at as, as not the gift from God that it is. But one in which a, a, a couple people, may, only a couple people made it to heaven, you know, just, just to be driven out in, just to be driven out later into Babylon, okay, all right. I mean, if you look at the promised land of rest, as heaven, you got a real problem. Okay, I sure don't want to get to heaven and then be driven out again into Babylon. It just doesn't make any sense. You can't do that, folks, with the Word of God. In Hebrews, we're told that the promised land is rest, and they didn't enter into rest because they didn't believe. I can't imagine the, the intelligence of, of a commentator who writes in 1 Corinthians uh, that, that all of these people went to hell. You know, they were overthrown in the wilderness because of their unbelief. They all went to hell. That included Moses. You're telling me God got him out of hell to... God, God took Moses out of hell to appear on the Mount of Transfiguration? 
Numbers chapter 20, verse 12, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Unbelief kept Moses out, and unbelief keeps you out of rest. It doesn't keep you out of heaven. It doesn't keep you out of eternal life. It, keep, it robs you of your joy and your peace and your rest. We're perplexed. Yeah, we're perplexed. You know, people are not thrilled to receive the good news. There's so much opposition to the sovereignty of God, the power of God, the majesty of God, that, that we're perplexed. You know, it perplexes me. But we don't give up. We're not in despair. I think the ninth verse is properly translated, we're persecuted but not forsaken. Folks, we need to understand that the major portion of our persecution comes from those who profess to be God's people. The major portion of your persecution comes from those who profess to be God's people but were not forsaken. You know, here's Paul in prison, condemned to die, soon to be beheaded, and yet he doesn't consider himself forsaken. Damas forsook him. But God hasn't forsaken you. You know, as, as great as the defeat may look to the human eye, you know, spiritually, Paul is victorious. He knew his life wasn't going to be spared. In fact, he tells Timothy he's fought a good fight. He's now ready to go and be with the Lord. I believe the Holy Spirit has clearly indicated to Paul that he's going to die, and yet he says, the Lord delivered me out of the mouth of the lion. He's not consumed or destroyed. Cast down, but not destroyed. That is, ruined. Verse 9. And that's the same word you see in Romans 14. Destroy not with thy meat thy brother for whom Christ died. You can ruin him. What you preach, folks, could ruin another brother in Christ. Well, how do you do that? Well, you know, if you want to be a good Christian, don't go to movies, don't drink, don't dance, don't play cards, don't paint your toenails, don't wear fluffy house shoes to church. Why? Well, whatever. You know, let me, let, me, let me give you a list of do's and don'ts for the Christian. Now, I'm destroying you. I am ruining you. I put you back under law and taking you out from under grace. That's, that's ruining you. Dearly beloved, we were told in 1 Corinthians that, that the true messenger of God is never popular. I say this again. I say it, I say it with fear and trembling. I believe any movement, any exercise that is popular is not of the Holy Spirit. If it is, you've got to show me that in the Word. God says, I, don't, I didn't call many wise, many mighty, many noble. And I have to conclude then that most of the high, wise, mighty, and noble are not gods. And even if they are gods, they're not, they're not called in the sense of service. I believe the one who's faithfully proclaiming this book is not very well liked. He's not very popular. And his movement isn't very big. Never happened to Paul. You know, there were persecutions and stonings and lashings, shipwrecks, starvations, danger. But there wasn't any popularity. And in 2 Timothy, I'm told that Paul is a prototype of all the rest who should follow him. And as I look at Paul, I see a man who was not properly received in anywhere he went. In fact, thrown out of city after city because he faithfully proclaimed the truth of, the, of, of this book. I think the cast down has more to do with his ministry among believers than, than it ever had to do with the uh, community outside of Christ. Now, he sure looks ruined. You know, he, he's a criminal, he's in prison. Surely isn't anything to suggest Paul was a success in the eyes of the uh, sensible human community. He started out as a wealthy man, a Pharisee among Pharisees. The tradition tells us that Paul could have paid every man's working wages in the city of Jerusalem for a year. That's a lot of money. Now all of a sudden I see him as a man with no wife. You know, she either died or, or much more likely she probably just left him because he accepted Christ in our Christian slang. 
when the truth is that in his own words, he was known of Christ on the road to Damascus. I, I see a man who went from the high pedestal of the Sanhedrin uh, to a man forsaken by his own family, rejected by his own nation. Now he's languishing in prison, ready to be executed as a criminal, not ruined. You know, from, from our viewpoint, he would have looked ruined, but he's not. Verse 10, always bearing about in the body the putting to death of Jesus, that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. We'll look at the 10th verse next week, Lord willing. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Thank you so much for all of your prayers, your concern, your support. Uh, I will mention that no place does it say that Christ laid down His life, Zoe, for you. He laid down His life, Suke, for you. There's two, two different words there in the Greek. Uh, but this is not Suke. This is Zoe. Uh, we'll continue looking at that uh, Lord willing next week. Until then, rest in Him. Thanks for watching.